to The Tenderness Revolution, a podcast about the stories of kindness, compassion and empathy that play out in our lives, because these deeply moving experiences describe what it means to be human and invite us into a new way of thinking about the world and each other. I'm your host, writer and journalist Yvonne Gavin, and every episode I'll be asking a new interviewee about a pivotal moment of tenderness that helped shape the course of their life. Today, for the last episode of season two, I had the absolute pleasure of chatting with the endlessly upbeat, wise and fun British TV and radio personality, Janie Lee Grace. Now, Janie's career kicked off with a stint as a backing and session singer during the 80s for the likes of George Michael and Kim Wilde, before Janie went on to build a successful career in TV and radio, appearing on various daytime and prime TV shows and working as a radio presenter for the BBC. But Alongside her career as a public figure, Janie also pursued a lifelong fascination with all things to do with natural and alternative health. And it's this fascination that has become her true passion. Janie's first book, Imperfectly Natural Woman, which was a bestseller, was followed by Happy, Healthy, Sober, Ditch the Booze and Take Control of Your Life. Starting off with Janie's own experience of giving up alcohol, a decision she says she took simply because she wanted to be as happy and healthy as possible. The book then takes the reader through the 30-day challenge, which supports them through the initial phase of sobriety. The truth is, this conversation goes into uncomfortable territory because we talk about this thing called grey area drinking, which describes something that's incredibly common, yet not really talked about, and is basically a tendency to drink more wine or beer or gin and tonics in the week than you know is good for you. And even though you can and do stop drinking from time to time, you keep going back to it But there's this nagging concern in the back of your mind because you know that it's not making your life better overall. It's hard to define and that's why we cover it in this conversation and discuss an even bigger issue which is this frantic lifestyle that so many of us lead and how we often use alcohol as a way of numbing our feelings and coping. Janie's really open about the fact that she spent so many years covering up her own anxiety and negative feelings. And we talked about the process of gaining awareness of our own difficult feelings and what's behind them, as well as so many other really helpful and inspiring things like why you first need to focus on the reason behind your desire to change a habit, your sense of purpose, and also how we can go about changing habits when the people around us and the environment we're in can't change. Even if you have a positive relationship with drinking and have no sober curiosity whatsoever, there may still be other aspects of your life that you'd like to work on, and the approaches that Janie and I discuss in this conversation can and do brilliantly with all kinds of behaviour change. If you'd like to know more about the concept of tenderness that we're trying to promote on this podcast, we send out a newsletter before every episode that explains some of the ideas behind the episodes. So if you'd like to be included, just message us on social media or pop us a quick email to the tenderness revolution at gmail and we'll add you right away. Thanks so much for your support as always throughout the second season. I've really enjoyed recording these conversations. It's wonderful to think that they might have helped some of you in some way, and I'd love to read all about it in your reviews. But for now, here's my conversation with Janie Lee Grace. 
I'm so excited to be talking to Janie Lee Grace today. Welcome, Janie. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here. I really love all the work that you're doing with the Sober Club and everything that's connected to it. It's really interesting. And I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting about all of that with you. And I think it's something that actually affects all of us, even if we don't drink alcohol ourselves. But first, I wanted to start off by asking you to share your moment of tenderness with you, a particular moment that that really means something to you, because the idea behind the Tenderness Revolution podcast is that essentially our lives are made up of all these little stories stitched together. And when we shine a light on scenes where we felt a profound sense of connection to something bigger than ourselves, moments where we felt seen or understood or that we had a deeper relationship to the world around us, it's as though we're awakened to a greater sense of meaning and purpose. So please do share your moment with us, Janie. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, sadly, it's one that requires quite a lot of explanation, which I won't have time to do the whole explanation, but I'll be able to give you the essence of it. Um, So um, I don't know whether you or your listeners have heard of something called Family Constellations, which is the most amazing work. Um, devised by a psychotherapist, Bert Hellinger, uh, who's now passed away. Um, it, it really is tricky work to explain, so it's hard to go into all the elements of it. But essentially, it is um, a workshop experience, usually, where um, we call in the energy field. And at that point, people go, oh, it's woo-woo and bonkers. Um, And I I did the very first time I kind of went to a family constellations workshop. I was thinking, what even is this? Um, But the long and the short of it is um, whether it's magic or woo woo or whatever it is, it is really profound. And um, what happens is if you are a if you are an issue holder or we sometimes call them tissue holders (laughs) because it's very emotional you would typically share with the therapist you'd probably be in a circle of however many people from all walks of life um literally uh and you would share with the practitioner what your issue is what you are what's going on for you and then you would ask someone in the circle to represent you so you don't represent yourself someone represents you it's not acting it's 100 not acting All the person is doing is standing in the energy field, in most cases, the center of the room and tuning into your energy. Okay. Mm. now, the very first time I did this, I thought, oh, no, I'm I used to be an actress and a singer. I thought, oh, God, I'm going to start bringing myself in. This is just going to be disastrous. But in fact, it doesn't happen at all. If you allow if you just let go and let you let yourself not be there effectively, Um, you very quickly realize you genuinely are tuning into the energy of someone else, whether alive or 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 passed on or even the energy of a country or the energy of um, uh, anything, anything at all. So it's fascinating work. And then other people represent often other members of your family because it's all based on the importance of the family of origin and the whole um, uh, uh, impact of epigenetics, how intergenerational trauma is passed on. Um, so it sounds terribly complex, but to sum it up in a nutshell, to get to my point, I um, my issue that I represented with, that I shared with the practitioner, this was some years ago, was that I was did not feel I was a good enough mother. I have four children. At that point, they were... Um, I don't know, um, ranging from sort of uh, seven to Mm. 13, something like that. Mm. Uh, And I represent, I, what I was saying was I didn't feel I was a good enough mother. And Mm. I, I, I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know how to um, be around enough. I didn't know how to play. Mm. Um, And then of course, um, as so often happens in constellation work, um, from that moment the the therapist the practitioner effectively um the issue is irrelevant because it's never about the issue (laughs) it's always about what's beneath it Mm. so we immediately looked at my relationship with my own mother yeah and the 
practitioner asks for facts, not stories. So you don't sit there going, oh, and he was an absolute git to me. And, that you know, you, you share yeah. the facts, the important facts. You know, did someone have an illness? Did they die young? Was there miscarriage involved? Was that, you know, the, the, the big stuff. Um, and I shared that my mother um, had had mental illness all of her life since she was um, 17. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, bipolar is the diagnosis. Oh. And um, so I'd spent much of my childhood um, with her in sort of mental institutions and stuff. But I explained to the practitioner what I knew, which is oh. that when my mum was nine years old, her mum died. And she died in childbirth, giving birth to her brother. But here's the kicker. <laughs> she was never told that her mother had died. Her father kind of came back from the hospital with this baby brother and no mum. What? Um, yeah, she wasn't told. So she wasn't told till she was uh, 17 or 18 oh. or something. Um at which point she had a massive nervous breakdown. I mean, why would you not? <laughs> why would you not, right? Which then, of course, got diagnosed as a mental illness. Um, so with that knowledge, um, we asked someone to represent my mother. And this person stood in the field, in the field, as it were, in the field of energy. Oh. And actually, <laughs> for me, just sitting there watching this woman, it was the most bizarre experience because she immediately took on the stance of my mum. Nobody else would, could possibly know that. I knew it because it was a very particular stance. But I only actually saw when she was um, actually having an episode where she was really unwell. But I knew it. I knew it instantly. It was very bizarre. So that was my first kind of thing. I think, oh, my goodness. Wow, this is incredible. And then the constellation played out where they asked someone else to represent um, her dead mother. So there's a woman lies down on the floor. And just looking at that scene was absolutely life changing right there, looking at the energy of something that had never happened. It had never happened. She was never allowed to grieve. <gasps> never allowed to even acknowledge that her mother was dead. So then the, con the, con the practitioner brings in someone to represent me. So then there's this woman standing there and I can suddenly see this girl, this daughter standing behind a mother who is looking down at her own dead mother. And what has she got to give me? What, how could she possibly be available to me? Oh. It just was not, possible it was not she had nothing to give and it was just fascinating anyways I could go on because it goes on forever the story the the they you know uh, the well the complexity goes on forever the actual mm -hmm. constellation lasts 45 minutes but it's literally life-changing because what happened next was we the energy of the grandmother who had died um was able to kind of pop up and and look at me and I could feel such an incredible attachment to that grandmother. Oh, um, really, oh really gosh. amazing. I still feel it now. I really do. I still feel it now. I still feel that attachment to that grandmother. Um, and, and I was able to have a conversation with the energy of my mother. My mother's still alive, by the way. And it's a conversation that will, would never have happened and will never happen. But that doesn't matter. I had a conversation with the energy of the soul if you like of 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 my mother in that room um where you know she said I'm sorry I you know I I absolutely love you but I I didn't, didn't have anything didn't have anything and I was able to say well you know what and this lovely phrase from family constellations I got enough to be me right I got enough to be me and for the first time I was able to see that and I'd spent years being bitter and twisted and, pre you know, talking about how my mum pressed every button. And even the kids would notice I was mean to her. She'd just say, you're so mean to grandma. You know, and isn't that everyone does? Isn't that what everyone does? All adults go see their parents and then become really quite horrible children again. Um, and it was it was literally incredible. The, the constellator had me stand at the front of a line of women. 
and I was able to kind of look back at this this gen, you know generations of amazing strong women and I was there I was at the front of the line right and looking forward at my my four children you know I got enough to be me um and it it changed everything everything in that 145 minute session so much so that I've now I'm now trained in family constellations so I now do this work because I find it so unbelievably powerful that crossing crossing everything but for me that was a really defining point because I've done a huge amount of work over the years as you can imagine with that kind of upbringing I've, I have had had in inverted commas everything <laughs> hypnotherapy you know I joked in my I did a TEDx talk and I joked in it I said you know I've had I've tried everything you know EFT you know NLP TFT ABC <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was the kicker that that was the moment you know okay it's not about what happened to you again mm-hmm. another f- lovely phrase from family constellations it's not about what happened to you it's what you you made it mean yes you know, it's yes, recognizing it's you know i got enough to be me right mm-hmm. now now from that place let's crack on right let's be mm-hmm. be our best selves let's live our best lives let's be kind let you know and i never ever needed to be the slightest bit mean to her ever again it changed everything even the kids know the kids noticed instantly wow it was really cool. incredible and I'm, I feel so blessed that I had that experience in, in her lifetime. Yeah. However, having said that, Constellations works brilliantly, even if someone's died. It really does, because the energy changes. What an so, incredible... That, yeah, it is amazing. What you've just I hope said. I've explained it well enough, because it's really complex. I wrote an article on Family Constellations for um, Spirit and Destiny magazine soon after that. And, and of course, the editor just kept sending it back, going, but what do you mean? Yeah, the end- yeah, yeah. Like, oh. And in oh. the end, I, I explained it as best I could. And then I actually just kind of said, look, we're going to have to put a line in this article mm. that just says, I know it sounds odd, but be willing to just come and experience mm. the magic. You know? mm. No, I read about it on your website. Mm-hmm. I came across it, I think, yesterday or the day before. And I was wondering what it was. Yeah. Um, I wondered if it was similar to family systems therapy. Yes, I'm sure there are links. I'm sure there are. Yeah. Um, I don't know much about exactly how that works, but it will definitely be have similar, um, you know, similar threads running through it. Yeah. I suppose the the premise is like, just like you said, you know, we are our family history, like we embody yeah. it like on the yeah. cellular level. Yeah, literally. But the energy part is fascinating. Yeah, Absolutely it really is. I mean, what's really amazing is in some of the constellations that we've done in the last few months, I've been working with a, a, a great leading trauma expert while mm. I find my feet. I only trained last year. Um, and, and it's just been amazing because we've seen such incredible shifts. I remember one constellation where there was one woman who is a member of my sober club and, um, and, and her constellation was around um, a family member who is still alive, but there'd been this thing going on all her life, like, oh, you know, um, he doesn't love me enough. There's, it, it, it had been playing out for many years, probably, you know, 35, 40 years, wow. this belief, this strong belief and this feeling of not being enough and not being loved. And we did this constellation and the constellation showed Um, And of course, there are many things in constellations that we will never know are true. Sometimes they do turn out to be true. People do a bit of digging and find that it's absolutely true, but we don't always know. But the constellation showed that um, this person's family member, again, had not been given the support they needed as a child and and had chosen to be kind of cut off from emotions. So that's what the constellation showed. And she was able to make peace with that. And in the constellation, the person representing the family member was able to find the words to say, words to the effect of, you know, I do love you. I I am proud of you, but I don't do emotions. You know, I don't have anything to give. Um, And she was able to kind of make peace with that, Mm -hmm. went away, found that it completely changed her energy so she felt different about it. it wasn't withholding phone calls or anything, just felt different. And within a couple of months, there she was flying out to some foreign country to spend time with this person. And it was as if those 35 years of misery had been, you know, didn't, didn't need to happen. Wow. Because sometimes, you know, things actually, actually happen. 
people people will do a constellation about an estranged family member and and a week later they'll ring them up how, completely you, out of the blue but it's amazing the, the the idea behind it is I suppose this sense that you know really difficult things do happen in life like that's basically what life is we can't it's change what's perfect. happened absolutely yeah and absolutely difficulties and traumas but you know obviously the stories we create around them is what causes problems for us but it's that piece of understanding what was it that drove that person to behave that way you know when they're acting in a mean way or a cruel way if you can understand where that's coming from yeah I mean you don't always get resolution there because sometimes you actually genuinely don't know sometimes you don't know sometimes the information isn't there I mean you can do constellations with people who have no idea who their family of origin is you know they were perhaps adopted and they really genuinely have no idea Mm -hmm. um it doesn't that bit exactly what happened isn't as important as acceptance yeah that it's not it's it's not yours to carry that's the really crucial bit what we tend to do is we carry stuff that isn't ours Mm. and when we're able to hand back what isn't ours Mm. it that's when we can be free most of us carry a shed load of baggage right some of it is not ours to carry it's not yeah you know it, it it may be you know we may be just carrying these stories oh I'm no good at this Mm. you know I'm terrible at that because some school teacher once told you or a or a parent and it may not even be your immediate family it could be something absolutely generational yeah from seven generations back literally and of course some people believe it could be from a past life doesn't even have to be in this lifetime right Yeah. yeah but it's but, amazing how we can break the cycle we can literally break the cycle and not pass this on to our kids definitely and it's as though like you said you're not necessarily finding an answer but it's like you're connecting to a feeling like someone Absolutely. else's feeling it's like whatever happened they felt this way about it and it was that feeling that caused them to behave the way they did and I think that part is just so it's so profound because you know I I've had moments as well in my life where you know you're you're going around there's this story and then suddenly you're like huh but it was because they felt this they felt you know a trauma they they were they felt rejected they felt abandoned that's why they acted that way towards me but it's it's so it's just amazing I mean just think if we all were able to do this work well that's why I've I've said for a long time it should be on the NHS it really should I mean it really should if if everyone had one session of family constellations I mean (laughs) preferably many but one session would 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 help a lot it really would Um, and once you've even if you don't do your own issue when you come to um, a constella- uh, constellations workshop I, I mean I've attended as a attendee I've been to you know 30 40 um, not not doing my own issue but being part of other people's observing or being part of other people's yeah. the what what you the, the perceptions you get the the change in your ability to understand other human beings is incredible you become so much more compassionate oh. and almost always you will be chosen in inverted commas to represent someone where there is some something going on with you that resonates with that they don't know that of course they don't but it almost always works out that way so the so other it's, people, it's really fascinating the other people are just like you they're not trained they're not they're not no 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 just, no they're just like you and they willingly they just feel like called to stand up and embody no no you you choose someone you you literally go and 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 say you know if you were sitting in the circle and it was my constellation I might come and say to you would you be willing to represent me and you can say yes or you you can say no and it's fine if you say no but if you say yes then you you do nothing other than stand in the field you don't put a hat on or get dressed a certain way or try and look at me it's you just simply step into the energy. So, I mean, you might be, I remember one of the first constellations I did, I was asked to represent death. And immediately I'm thinking, you know, my, my rational brain is thinking, well, that's charming, isn't it? Oh, charming. <laughs> well, I wonder how I'm getting, you know, how is the actress in me going to represent death? Yeah. You know, I, I had to just shut up and just literally stand in the energy field. And what was really fascinating was that 
as I stood in the energy field as death, I felt absolutely nothing, completely neutral, completely neutral. I just was. I literally just was. I had no attraction in inverted commas in any way. I didn't want to connect with anyone. I didn't want to look at anyone. I wasn't interested in what any the conversation was. It was really fascinating. But mm. one of the people in the constellation who, you know, sadly was focused on death, was attracted to death, literally came and stood behind me. It was really interesting. Mm. This, I mean, it, it you know, I could go on for hours about this stuff because it's fascinating, but, but it isn't acting is my point. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and if you're chosen to represent and you want to represent, sometimes they're called like flags in the wind, the representatives, they just, they just stand there. And sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll say, I don't feel anything. Um, sometimes they'll say, you know, I feel really hot or really, or a little bit upset. Or, it, it, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. And you, you start to know, very quickly that it isn't your own stuff that you're bringing in because if you're asked to represent someone who whose beliefs or actions are the antithesis of your own you very quickly get to realize that this is not about you Mm. it's absolutely not about you physically or emotionally It's, it's, it's fascinating and what an amazing experience that is like you said it's like it's real compassion it's that yeah it really is real understanding it helps you understand your own family dynamics in a completely Mm. different way um makes you much more present as a as a parent if you've got kids makes you a you know um a better um you know daughter son wife whatever whatever it is you have a different different sense of compassion because nobody knows what's going on in other people's lives do they or past lives (laughs) no I am so interested. I'm definitely, definitely going to look into that. I'm going to oh, be- see if you can come oh. to one of our workshops if oh, you're in uh, the UK for a while. I would love to. So it's been really, really wonderful to start off our conversation by really understanding the the feelings, I suppose, that that were going on for you. And I, I guess it's those feelings that drove some of the behaviours that you experienced around alcohol. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that sort of more recent journey and mm. what, did you stop drinking, was it 2007? Uh, yeah, yeah, nearly five years ago now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so so I I was, an, you know, always was a, in inverted commas, normal, in inverted commas, drinker, meaning I never had a rock bottom moment. I never had a day off work. I never really had hangovers. I didn't have, a, you know, I never drove. And I, you know, um, I, I was in inverted commas normal. Um, I, I drank, you know, because everyone drank. I, you know, went to a play date and everyone drank. I had parties and we drank and, you know, on and on. Yeah. Um, as everyone does in inverted commas. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was sort of queen of health and well-being. You know, I wrote several books on holistic living. I was very focused on, on, um, uh, natural skincare and organic food and, and everything to do with holistic living. But this one piece, this, this kind of um, elephant in the room is what it really was. I, I managed to tiptoe around that elephant in the room for God, 20 years, literally 20 years. Mm. Um, and, and, it, and initially I don't, I genuinely didn't notice it at all. You know, I just, I, it's what everybody did. I used to love the articles that said, oh, a glass of wine is good for the heart. You know, and I think that's absolute BS. But, you know, at the time I loved those articles. Um, my website and book was called Imperfectly Natural. So, you know, it's cool for me to be imperfect, right? Of course I'm, you know, I do everything, I do everything else um, on a, in a totally healthy way. So of course I can down, you know, half a bottle of uh, Sauvignon or whatever. So that's the story I told myself for years. Yeah. Um, and when my kids were young, um, I the drinking definitely ramped up. I, I really definitely was mad, you know, seriously mad busy. And my my stress relief, I thought, was to go and have a, a, a you know, nice chilled glass of wine. And we um, happened to live near a, a, to a kind of a wine bar. And that became my little haven. Oh, it's mm. me, you know, mum's going to, if we've got someone to look after the kids, mum gets her treat, you know. Oh, God. I mean, I look back now and I, I, I feel sorry for that person. I really do. But anyways, oh. um, it went on for years, you know, years and years. Yeah. And it's only, um, it was only, I don't know, perhaps 10 years ago, maybe um, 10, 15 years ago, I started to get the kind of the little voice that would say, 
oh I wonder if this is okay because you know drinking quite a lot you know like not you're not just having a glass of wine you're having like half a bottle and and then sometimes if it was summer you know you might go out for lunch and so you'd have a couple of glasses and then you'd pop to the wine bar if the kids are looked after so you'd have a glass there and then you know share a bottle with dinner I mean be rude not to right and and I remember sort of waking up sometimes I always woke up at 3 a.m of course I did you know my liver was trying to tell me something um and I would like lie there with you know the ceiling slightly spinning and I would be trying to count the amount of units I'd had oh you know and it's like well oh god well so did I actually have my god I actually had one in the afternoon because the sun was shining and then oh my god that someone came around and I, I sat in the garden and that's like how many and you know I'd lie there thinking this is something not right mm. this isn't right it's not right with who I am I'm meant to be healthy I'm meant to care about my health and well-being this is there's something not okay about this um, and I'd make that decision to start okay right this is going to stop you know clearly I'm not a rock bottom so I'm you know I'm not about to start you know going to AA or anything ridiculous I'm perfectly fine obviously I can stop and then the next day would come and I'd get to 6 p.m. And the wine witch would say, oh, God, you've had such a busy day. You're exhausted. You're frazzled. You deserve a nice glass of wine. And then it would all start again. You deserve And it went, yeah. went on for years, mm. literally years and years. And over those years, I, you know, I would rock up to, to therapists and, and healers and, uh, you know, um, doctors uh, for something else, you know, obviously for something else. And and then if I felt really safe and secure, I'd say, you know, actually, can I just share something with you? I'm a, I'm a bit worried about my drinking, actually. Really took a lot for me to ask that. Mm. Really took a lot. Um, and in every single case, and I can remember clearly at least five times, at least five over the years, whoever it was, therapist, doctor, healer, practitioner would say, oh, well, you, you look look fine. Well, well, how, how much are you drinking? You know, what, like few glasses and I'd go well yeah I mean obviously everyone lies they they know you lie and they go oh well um you seem fine I mean it's completely normal just um just have an alcohol-free day yeah oh my god if I had a quid for every time someone had said that stupid sentence never say to someone who's admitting they're worried about their drinking have an alcohol-free day I mean really seriously and I now know that those people weren't you know, malicious or hot or, or mean, mm. you know, they were just normal because they were drinking too. Yeah. Or they had no concept of gray area drinkers, those people not completely at rock bottom. If I'd said I need, you know, vodka on my cornflakes to get me started of a day, they would have known That's which box to put yeah. me in. Mm. Right. But it's a very tiny percentage of people who are in that box, thankfully. But there are millions of people who are just like me, grey area drinkers. They're not at rock bottom yet, but they're drinking more than they want to. And they're caught in the alcohol trap and they can't get out. And there's not enough people, you know, throwing a positive light on that. What they should have said to me is, oh, wow, well, well done you for noticing that. And you know what? There are, you know, there are some amazing resources out there mm. that can help you literally live your best life without mm. booze. Mm. You know, and even if they weren't the person they needed to be able to refer on you know yeah um I mean hopefully it's changing because you know the the the, the scene is growing of course the you know the, the the sober revolution is definitely growing yeah um but back then you know I it, it that kept me stuck so then I'd come away from the GP or the healer uh, practitioner and think oh thank goodness for that I'm completely normal uh, and it would all just carry on again and it's just so normalized, isn't it? It's like you said, even like the GP was probably yeah. thinking, well, oh, that, God, yeah. that's what I have. So it's yeah. such, we're so entrenched in this culture that none of us want to say, well, maybe it's not because actually I don't feel that good, but none of us want to say that mm. or admit it. No, exactly. So, so then it just, it just keeps, you know, it just keeps going on. It's, yeah. it's self-perpetuating but this yeah. gray area drinker that is really interesting can you tell yeah. so what? jolene park came up with the phrase get gray area drinking when mm. she uh she did a, a, a tedx talk and i yeah. i credit her in my tedx talk because um it, it really is a, a a fantastic way to properly understand that 
in the UK, certainly, we tend to think there's two types of drinkers. We think there's those who are at rock bottom, as I said, and, 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 and need, you know, are clinically dependent, need alcohol services. And we kind of know which box to put those people in. And then we think there's everyone else and everyone else are happy social drinkers, completely 100 percent fine, just very occasionally, you know, can't hold their beer. But that's not the reality. It's a spectrum. It's a spectrum of different shades of grey. And I say in my tech, TED talk, at least 50 shades of grey and none of them sexy. <laughs> yeah. uh, because we're all on that kind of booze elevator. And, and, and actually, the reality is you don't have to wait till you get to rock bottom before you step off. So wherever you are down that little booze elevator, you know, have a little look at, well, where am I on it? And would, would my the question I try and ask people to ask themselves is ask yourself would my life be better physically and emotionally without booze now if you're someone who drinks you know if you really are only one notch down from the top and you have a sherry every Christmas then the answer to that will be no I'm good well that's fine I'm not for prohibition not at all I'm not trying to say no one should ever drink but I genuinely think there are millions of people who if you say to them if you think, if you really think about it, could your life be better physically and emotionally without the booze? There's a little bit, a sense in their gut that says, God, yeah, imagine what it would be like not to wake up with a hangover. Imagine what it would be like not to have to rush away from a bedtime story to have wine. Imagine what it would be like to be able to plan a trip to the ice rink without needing to check if there's a bar. I wonder what, it, you know, and on and on. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's that's the reality. It's true. And I think it's but it's like people don't want to go there they don't want to admit it they don't want to well they, the reason they don't want to is because it, just like me it feels too frightening yeah because most people um are um pretty 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 savvy they're getting on with their lives they're pretty healthy they're doing what they do it's actually quite hard to admit that you're finding mm. stopping drinking hard mm. it's really yeah. difficult and then you and then you start to think i'm the only one who's finding this hard because yeah. everyone else is all doing good right they're all completely fine it's only me waking at 3 a.m mm. and when you realize it isn't when you realize there are a huge number of people going through this and when you can catch sight of a better life without booze mm. that's when it gets exciting no one ever told me in all the years that i was ruminating it because of course I thought about it of course I did I I read lots of literature about you know how to stop you know I read um and 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 I did stop for for for, for periods of time I sort of NLP'd myself into knowing that alcohol was really bad for me and I must stop and I and I did that and it worked for a while it worked for a while so you can you can force yourself a little bit like you know we force ourselves to go on diets um and but but all the while you're focusing on what you're not having yeah. because you think you can't control it. Yeah. So you think that the, the unconscious kind of mind is thinking um, everyone else is fine, but there's something wrong with me. And because there's something wrong with me, I need to do something about it. So I'm going to have to stop drinking. Oh, God, I don't want everyone. Look at those people having fun. I'm not going to have fun anymore. I've got to stop drinking. It's just so awful, but I'm going to have to do it. So I'll do it. So you do for a bit until your unconscious mind says, well, this is rubbish. Everyone else is having fun. I'm not. So it's a complete change of mindset that's needed. Because yeah. actually life is better without booze. If you'd have told me that, you know, six years ago, I just wouldn't have believed you. If you'd have told me that, I would never desire a glass of wine. If I would not drink one for a million quid. I wouldn't take a sip for a million quid. No way. Why would I do that? Any more than I'd have heroin. Why would I do that? Yeah. I wouldn't have believed you, though, if you'd said that to me. <laughs> I think that'd be ridiculous. No. Pour me another glass. Exactly. But what was really interesting about what you just said is I think this thing about feeling good. And that is, I think, a really helpful part of it, but not one that people often use when they're considering sort of drinking less or mm. I think it often it's more a sense of I've got to be disciplined or I've got to be, you know, more, it's more of a kind of punitive kind of. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. exactly it. That's why I don't let people use the phrase giving up. I never use the phrase giving up. I only ever say ditching the booze or quitting. Mm. If you use the phrase giving up, it, your unconscious mind thinks you're missing out on something, but you're missing out on nothing. You're only gaining. And when you change that mindset, 
you know, everything changes. My, my course as part of the Sober Club is called Get the Buzz Without the Booze, because you really can. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting um, acronym that you use. It's HALT. Yeah. How, can you go through that? How yeah, that- sure. I mean, a, a lot of people use you use this this phrase. It's, it's it's not mine. It's been in many 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 books. But but it basically, it encourages you when you're when you're craving um, um, booze or anything. Actually, ask yourself first: Is it that I'm hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? Uh-huh. Okay. Now, hungry hunger is a big one. I always often used to reach for alcohol when actually I just needed food. I just needed proper good nutrition, yeah. but you know, oh, we weren't eating dinner till eight. So, you know, it's six o'clock and, and, and I didn't even recognize that what it really was, was hunger. I just needed something, you know, t- to satisfy me. It didn't necessarily have to be a huge meal, but I needed something to satisfy me. So I reached for wine, completely empty calories. Right. Um, so always check if you're hungry, in which case, obviously go and eat when you're ditching the booze. It's not a time to be trying to lose weight at all absolutely not <laughs> a lot of people will say oh well I may as well lose a few pounds so I won't eat either no 100 <laughs> percent no um you need to eat really good nutritious food because the brain chemistry will be you know all out of whack so ask yourself if you're hungry ask yourself if you're angry often we reach for a drink because we're just really fed up angry or stressed or someone sent us an email or someone said something that's really upset us or we've had an awful day at work or we're angry angry at ourselves so of course it's easier just to reach for the booze and numb it out are we lonely well you know that for so many people is why they turn to the bottle um Mm -hmm. i've had i've had um, it's been very interesting in, uh, because of lockdown, of course, lots of people, even people who'd stopped drinking, some of them went back to it. They were on their own. Right. I've had people in the sober club say to me, it's only when I stopped drinking, um, I've, I've, I've had to really take a good look at myself because I now realize I haven't got anything in my life. I come back from work and the hours stretch in front of me and I'm really lonely and they had never even noticed it. Um, and of course, we can turn that on its head and, and, and say, OK, then look at look at this amazing opportunity to bring back, you know, some something into your life, whether it's creativity or friendship or fun or whatever it might be. Many of us have lost sight of what we want. We've absolutely lost sight of it. Um, so connection is everything. And there's this lovely expression, you know. Um, connection is the opposite of addiction and that's why I run the sober club so you check in if you're lonely if you're lonely you know if you have a friend nearby fabulous if you don't check into the sober club because there'll be somebody there you know who you can connect with who understands how that feels and don't forget you can be lonely even if you're with people right Mm. even if you have a family you might still be lonely because what's going on in your head you can't really share it with anyone that's why you do need connection with people who are going through the same thing or have been through it you know years ago um, and then the tea is for tired. And that's a really obvious one. Again, we, we, we drink alcohol to pep us up, you know, to allegedly give us a bit more energy. Funny that, isn't it? Because allegedly it's a relaxant as well. You know, oh. the reality is it's neither. We just think it is. Um, so, you know, obviously, if you're tired, go and have a nap you know, <laughs> or, or a lie down. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you start with those things. Yeah. Then because what happens is our brain its a think, feel, act cycle that we follow, isn't it? We have a thought. Oh, you know, I'm feeling really, really, um, really, really fed up. I want to feel more relaxed or I want to feel grown up. I've had a day with the kids. I want to feel grown up. Action. How do I do that? Reach for a glass of wine. We have to learn to put the pause in so we can ask what is it I really want here? Mm. Because it ain't toxic liquid. Mm. Isn't actually ever that ever. Mm. It's always something else that we want. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what is it really? Is it that we want to feel confident or or is it that we want to feel relaxed? Is it that we just want to step away from the noise in our head? Is it that we want to fit in with the social group? It's always something else. And once we identify what it is, we can start to find resources and ways to do that differently. Mm, Absolutely. And you mentioned, so in Holt, there's, you know, there's, well, there's a few feelings in there and um, anxiety, I think, is another one. I watched um, I watched the, the TED talk by Jolene Park and I thought it was really interesting when she said beyond grey area drinking is something even bigger 
And that's a collective story of anxiety. And this is where we're collectively missing the mark. Rather than yeah. willpower, we need practical training in how to nourish our nervous systems in a revolutionary new way. Wow, that really struck me because I, and made me think about the pandemic actually as well, which you just mentioned. And that sense of, I'm feeling anxious. Oh, a, you know, a glass of wine will help. Yeah. Or I'm feeling lonely or yeah. I'm feeling angry, you know, it, it will help. And it's such a kind of, like I said before, it's such a, a an accepted self for all mm-hmm. those things. It's like, well, of 100%. course, that's what you should do. You, sh- you should do that because that will help. 100%. And, 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 and during lockdown, you know, there, were, there was even that unbelievably stupid trend of, oh, let's have a Zoom meeting. And if it's four o'clock, you know, we have to have a glass in our hand that has to have alcohol in it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I had a few sober club members who were tell, telling me this was a real problem for them. And I'm like, well, have you thought about putting something else in your glass on account of they're not even next to you? I mean, how can it possibly matter to someone else what you are putting in your mouth? Mm. Really? Mm. If you're a vegan and you choose to go to a barbecue, you, you know, you're good, right? You take your own. Mm. they don't have any vegan alternatives you take your own and everybody's happy yeah you know someone doesn't say to you oh I know you're vegan but you know in order to join in with the fun of this barbecue I need to hand you this you know this beef burger (laughs) and you you don't go oh actually I'm kind of thinking of oh I'm sorry you know I'm really sorry it's a little bit embarrassing but just no oh that's such an interesting analogy I'm really glad you did that but there is like social contagion isn't there this thing of well other people are doing it and when I go to the wedding or the party and they'll like hand me a glass of fizz on the way in and Mm -hmm. what like if I don't have it what will people think and and actually other people do think you you should have that because then I'll feel bad about my Mm -hmm. drinking if you because you're shining a light on other people and then but ultimately well, I mean, what I tell people to do in those situations is a whole load of prep in advance. So number one, if you've made your decision that you're not drinking, it has to be non-negotiable, end of. So there's a few things to that. You often have to ring ahead and tell your friends, and give them a heads up. If you're going out with a small group of friends and they know you as a drinker, then it does come as a shock to their system. And because a lot of us are people pleasers, we find ourselves ending up drinking to make someone else feel better, yes. which is utterly ridiculous. So if you take the shock out of it, it helps. So if you send them a text in advance and say, look, just want to let you know, you know, we're going to whatever it is. I'm not drinking alcohol at the moment. And you can give whatever reason you want. You can tell the truth if you like. You can say, you know, I feel so much better without it. You can say I'm doing a challenge. You can say I'm on antibiotics. It doesn't matter. You do whatever it takes, but you give them a heads up. And then you, the important bit is you say, You don't need to worry about me because I've got a fantastic kombucha that I really like or I've got an alcohol free beer. So you don't need to worry about me. I'm good. We're looking forward to seeing you. Mm. So you've given them the heads up. Now, there may still be friends who push it, you know, oh, don't be boring. Oh, which, by the way, is just too funny for words because (laughs) drunk people are boring beyond (laughs) boring. Um, But you might get someone who pushes it. And the top tip there is just, you know, smile sweetly, change the subject. You know, yeah, 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 great. Uh, it's making me feel good at the moment. By the way, how was your holiday? Change the subject. Because by the time they've had a couple of drinks, they don't care anymore. And then when it comes to, you know, what will you drink when you're there? You have to prep the head. Mm. You cannot go up. When you're in early days ditching the booze, you cannot go off to a wedding or a function or a, even a restaurant, really, unless you've prepped ahead what you're going to drink. Because if you do and you get there and all that, and that you say, oh, what soft drinks have you got? Oh, we have Coca-Cola and lemonade. I'm not 12. And that is not going to work for me. Right. And even if you go, oh, OK, I'll just have water. Everyone around you is popping corks, chinking glasses and looking at you as if you're a second class citizen and you just sit there and the unconscious mind says, this is not fun. This is not good. This was a really bad decision. And that's when you start drinking again. Mm-hmm. So you prep ahead, find out what they've got. If they haven't got any fabulous grown-up drinks preferably a huge selection then you tell them you'll be bringing your own because that's your dietary requirement so you then you take along a fabulous sparkling alcohol-free fizz if it's a wedding or a whatever you know unfortunately places are getting better at it but don't let them get away with not offering you anything you have a nice drink in a nice glass that expression of mine keep the ritual 
change the ingredients. So while they're chinking glasses, so are you. It's just you've got something different in your glass. What's mm. not to like? Mm. And if they pass you a drink as you go in, you just say, no, no thanks. Have you got anything else? And they will have. Because here's the other interesting thing. When you stop drinking, you go to events and you notice not everyone does drink. It's really interesting. You, you, you look yeah. around and you go, you start to notice very quickly, oh, that woman, she's going to feel terrible. I've seen how much wine she's drunk. I feel really feel sorry for her. And then you look around and you go, that guy's been on orange juice or I've seen him. That's interesting. He's had a glass in his hand. He hasn't taken a sip in it of it for the last three hours. You need to become a little bit of a kind of a anthropologist viewing the humans. It helps you pass can. the time. If you're not drinking, you can, because I, you're not kind of, you're not in that sort of alcohol. You haven't got the alcohol goggles on. You're, exactly. You're exactly. More expansive. Exactly. Yeah. And have a perspective that other people don't have. I, I remember when I was at university, I worked in a behind a bar for a while. And it was the first time in my life that I actually saw what happens when people drink. I remember yes. at the beginning of the night, everyone's quite nice and polite, you know, towards me. And they st- and then as the evening goes on, like people were turning into like not very nice versions of themselves, you know. Totally. And it was interesting to witness that because usually I was part of it. So I didn't realize that it was happening. I always recommend telling people to, you know, uh, book a cab early or or tell people you've got something going on. You know, you you, got to leave early because you will get fed up earlier. Yeah. Uh, Because it all just usually gets very messy, you know, so have something booked for the next morning so that you've got a good excuse or, yeah. So there are lots and lots of tips and tricks that can help you because the early weeks, you know, it is, it is so different. You can't mm-hmm. pretend it isn't. It's so different. But, you know, eventually you, you start to fit your sober shoes. You know, yes. that you, it become, you, you start to become who you really are. And I and, suppose you're just enjoying that thing of feeling good. Like, you know, like, like we were saying earlier. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few layers to it, really. Um, the reality is it, it takes a while. And sometimes, as with so many um, health issues, they sometimes say, you know, sometimes you have to feel a bit worse before you feel a bit better, you know? Um, Mm. So not everything does instantly um, become amazing. Sometimes people find they have really awful sleep, Mm. um, a lot of anxiety, a lot, because you know, your your body is screaming, where's my dopamine? What is going on? I want my dopamine back. I want my selenium. Where's my GABA? You know, it's screaming for all of this. Your brain chemistry is usually utterly out of whack and if there have been any health issues and inverted commas anything going on at all it will have been masked for ages so you know this is why this is why I get so frustrated that you know so I talk about this all the time but it drives me bonkers that women will rock up to a, a a GP and and say, you know, I've got, um, I've got uh, mood swings, you know, and anxiety, and I'm not sleeping well, and I, I've got sometimes might be hot flushes as well. And then they'll walk out with a prescription for HRT and or antidepressants. A huge percentage of my one-to-one clients have been given antidepressants, um, but they're not asked about their drinking. Mm. How can you give someone medication without checking the self-medication bit? Mm. So once you take away the booze, a lot of people are left with this medication that now is completely out of balance with the other medication that they've been on for months or years. Mm. So your poor, you know, um, <laughs> nervous system is completely shot to pieces and doesn't know what's going on. Completely so nervous. it's not as instant as, OK, take away the booze, everything perfect. Yeah. Sometimes there's a bit of recalibration yeah. to be done. Yeah. The, the, the really difficult part and the part that, a lot of people don't get to and I think this is the same with you know all this work this work that we do on ourselves is is awareness and I think one thing I've been thinking about a lot recently is you know you have to get to this place of awareness before maybe you're you might acknowledge to yourself or others yeah you know drinking is not really making me feel very good I think I need to have a break but lots of people don't get to that point and it can be really hard to gain that in ourselves but if there's someone in your life and you just really care about them but you you can see that they just don't have this mm. awareness 
I've often wondered like how how do we respond to them I know acceptance is really important but what would you say to that like how it's it's a really difficult one I mean I have had clients who um you know they are really worried about their partners or um you know uh someone very close to them and it's very difficult because um you know I've interviewed people on my podcast um who know more about this than I do who come from um a background where they're the child of alcoholic parents for example Mm -hmm. and you know you have to have some very tough conversations sometimes and you have to be able to ask yourself and it sounds like a terrible thing to say but you do have to ask yourself am I part of this am I enabling this to Mm. continue uh and that's a really tough one Mm. it's really tough because of course you love the person and you have compassion but by um not changing the status quo um possibly you're enabling it to continue Mm. so there isn't any one answer but you know ultimately of course the answer is that you can only do this for you Mm. you can't do it for anyone else you can't make someone else want to do it Mm. but if you do it for you and I've seen this happen many many times many times people make the decision okay I'm going to get well. I'm going to live my best life. I am going to do this for me. And it's non-negotiable. And I don't care whether I normally sit with my partner for, you know, drinks at 6 p.m. I'm going to keep the ritual, change the ingredients, and it's going to change. And and I'm going to tell him or her that I'm not going on the pub crawl or I'm actually, I'm not going to do the host, the whatever it is. And sometimes there has to be some boundaries set. And they do that. And they stick to what they're doing and they find themselves growing stronger and starting to blossom and grow and new, exciting things come into their life and they start to change. And the partner, of course, is watching all of this. Mm. And I've seen this on so many times that the partner will get a little sense of, hmm, okay, I want what she's having. And we'll ditch the booze too. Not always. I've also seen, I've also had clients whose marriages have broken up, Yeah. Um, but they've been able to do that in a far more um, amicable way than they otherwise would have done. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine there are situations where there's sort of anger comes up or a sense of resistance, you know, that, oh, you, you wanted to do something different. That's not what we do. You know, yeah. We, yeah. We, we have a glass of wine. Yeah, I mean, for many people, it's just what they do together you know they're people are drinking bodies and you may have you may never have never have you know your whole life's been lived through a haze of booze I mean an awful, for an awful lot of women I've I've coached a lot of women who when they first stopped drinking they had to kind of recognize hold on a minute every every big thing in my life every big emotional thing has been through the haze of booze there hasn't been anything that's not been through the haze of booze ever mm-hmm. and in fact they've never had sober sex yes think yeah. about that yeah, yeah. <laughs> right yeah. you start drinking when you're a teenager you drink through your life and I mean it's it, it, it's profound yeah. we don't we're not very emotionally intelligent often we kind of don't know yeah. what to say or do when we're not when we haven't got booze so that's that's why there's so much learning to do that's why yeah. it's yeah. we have yeah. to unwrap all these layers it's good yeah. though it's not I don't want to give the impression that it's you know, it's it's because it, it's worth it. It's so worth it. Um, and the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of this stuff is going to come back and bite you on the bum anyway. Mm. So you may as well deal with it yourself. <laughs> but what you're talking about there, that thing of the haze and, and you know, these difficult feelings going to coming back and biting you on the bum. It's sort of like a numbing out. And yeah, completely. it's like alcohol makes us it enables us to sort of numb things out and I've been thinking about that too and it I think it's really connected to this sort of pace that so many of us feel we have to live at this constant busyness and also this sense that nobody really wants to hear how I'm feeling so you know I just keep going on this treadmill of like pushing quashing down the feelings and then keeping going at that pace and alcohol's kind of the thing that you use like a crutch yeah and I just wonder like how like when is it when is it gonna end like when are we when 
you know, when is it going to be more acceptable to say, oh, I just I just want to take care of myself or, you know, to well, say I think no. it is changing. I do think it's changing. I really do. I mean, I've got, you know, a bunch of members in my sober club. We've all, you know, some of them are two years, three years, four years sober. Um, and they're inspiring the ones that are on day, day, day one, you know. And I mean, what's interesting is you you find your your group, don't you? You find the people who inspire you. One one woman who was on a program that I was running was really so interesting. I, I should have kept her posts that she wrote, but it was really fascinating. She, she'd she been sober for, I think, um, a couple of months, something like that. And she'd gone off to a, a like a holiday place that she goes to. And and she was really nervous about going because she it's somewhere she'd been going for many years and they always just sit around drinking. Yeah. So she was very nervous, but she took her alcohol free drinks and she knew it was non-negotiable and she, you know, she was looking forward to going away. But when she got there, she suddenly saw it all through completely different eyes and she realized, hold on a minute, this isn't me at all. I don't even want to be with these people. Huh? I don't even like them. They're actually not that kind. And the only thing they had in common was drinking. And she suddenly saw it through a completely new eyes because she was changing. She was becoming who she really was. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of those experiences can be quite painful Mm. that you come back to find out who you really are. Mm. So you can, there is a sense of stepping off that treadmill because you do get a new sense of sort of balance. Mm. And And a lot of people as well find that they can finally find the energy to go after what they really want there's been some just fabulous stories in the sober club one one woman counted up all the money she'd saved from not drinking and bought herself a camper van <laughs> so she could go wow. off on her travels you know someone else did a, went back to study and did a degree in creative writing wow. she would never have done that never have done that Oh, I love it. You know, there's, there's so many amazing stories. Yeah. Because people yeah. they find their feet, they 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 get their mojo back yeah. and they know what feels important to them. Definitely. That that sense of finding purpose, I would imagine, is a big part of kind of overcoming, you know, because it's it's a kind of addiction. Um so that's something that you really encourage actively. Definitely, in definitely, yeah. Yeah. I mean. I mean, we talk a lot about it. Mm. Of course, having said that, that's not that everybody, you know, is going to write a book or, or you know, climb a mountain or, or, or start a charity. Um, as uh, I interviewed uh, the lovely Kyle Gray, the angel expert, and as he said, you know, sometimes your purpose is just to be happy. Yeah. How cool, how cool would it be if we were able to just embrace that? Yeah. Because if someone is truly happy, then you think about the ripples they're spreading and the impact that has. It's massive. Mm. It's massive. But I think it goes back to this thing of, you know, in addiction. I mean, I, I know that you love Gabor Mate and his work, I think, is, is yeah, fascinating it's around addiction. And this sense that, you know, we're all addicted to something and whatever it is, like whatever we're using, whether it's, you know, over consuming or even just like zoning out by watching, you know. Yeah news all the time or being completely you know pulled into I don't know reading gossip or whatever it is that that we do it um I think it's sort of our society and the way that our society is built is is on you know enabling these addictions because it's what makes consumerism work it's like you mentioned money I mean how much money would be lost you know if we stopped consuming all of these things over consuming food like you know over consuming alcohol um everything feels like it's sort of against us it's like yeah completely I mean in the lockdown you know if you remember there was uh, everything was uh, anything that was beneficial to our health you know whether it's a park or a gym or whatever was 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 you know no longer operational yeah yeah. but the the off licenses were open and the and the fast food outlets yeah 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 um yeah it sometimes does feel as though everything's against us but you know what um you can make this non-negotiable and you can do it and and when you do it makes a difference and you are definitely testament to that I think you're really inspiring and I I think the work 
that you're doing, like I said at the beginning, it, even people who don't drink are often affected by this, by people in their life. And just generally by this sense of, of numbing out and, and uh, using addictive substances to kind of get through. Mm. Um, so yeah, we're coming towards the end of the interview. And, and there's a question that I always like to, <clears throat> excuse me, to ask at the end, um, because the idea behind the tenderness revolution, it's, it's having this quality of tenderness for ourselves and others. And they're the three C's um, that, sort of enable us to fully see the truth about the way things are and they are courage curiosity and compassion and I would like to ask if you had to choose one of these qualities that really means the most in your life what would you choose and why I, it's something I think about a lot actually because I talk a lot about this I um you know I, I'm also now training people to be sober coaches and one of the um, things we talk about that underpins the whole training really is curiosity. Mm. I think that um, when the, what's great about curiosity is it helps you to focus on a, a potential positive approach and a potential, um, you know, for good that may come out of something. Mm. And when things feel impossible, if you bring in the curiosity, it starts to become possible mm. or possibly, <laughs> possibly become possible um, rather than what we tend to do, which is we, we if we have limiting beliefs, they they're firmly stuck. So people say things like, oh, I could never do that. I'm always anxious. I can't give up. I could never give up drinking. You know, there's so much wrong with that sentence. <laughs> what we have to do is turn it around and ask, you know, well, I'm just going to become curious about this. I wonder if my life would be better without alcohol or whatever it is. So for me, bringing in the curiosity allows the possibility. And from that place, um, anything might happen. Mm, fantastic it's that quality of imagination isn't it it's that sense yeah. of if I can imagine a different reality exactly if I could imagine myself possibly going into these situations but just doing it differently it yeah. might still be fun or it might actually be a whole lot better you know yeah, exactly it is it is about that not allowing the negativity in but just the wonder and the curiosity as to how great it might be definitely love curiosity so so important in life well thank you so much Jamie I've loved talking to you today I feel like I've I've learned a lot and yeah I think it's really important for us to think about it no matter how uncomfortable I think it can make us this sense of maybe I should just try drinking a bit less certainly for myself as well so I really appreciate your honesty and your openness and yeah I really really appreciate your time so thank, thank you thank you I appreciate it time. thank you thank you I really hope you enjoyed this episode of the tenderness revolution the last of season two We've got some brilliant guests lined up for season three and I really hope that you come back for more conversations about what it means to be human because my aim with this podcast is to help us become more aware of how these intimate moments of compassion shape all of us and enable us to live with more purpose and meaning.